All right. Good afternoon, everyone. So my name is Victor Maus. I'm with the Vienna University of Economics and Business and also with the International Institute for Applied Systems Analysis. And the talk today is about basically data scarcity, training data scarcity, which is something that probably everyone here is familiar with. Um, I also have been talking about this uh, approach, dynamic time warp, with some of you already. Some of you already know this, have seen. This is not a, a, a work that I have developed recently, but it's a work that I continue to maintain since about 2016 when I was doing my, uh, finishing my PhD with Gilberto, which we heard this morning. And um, uh, so if you were uh, expecting something like this, I will disappoint you because some of you, when I was talking about dynamic time warping, you were thinking about something a bit more fancy, but we're not gonna go to these details here. Uh, what I want to talk to you is uh, that something that we have seen in other presentations already is that the uh, increasing a in inserting a temporal dimension into the satellite time series, it's satellite cl image classification improves a lot the accuracy. So that's what we have been seeing. We have papers, we have a lot of literature that shows that basically that the more we increase the temporal data availability, we get to increase the accuracy. So and how we actually uh, do that is something that we heard Schubert talking this morning is that we convert, uh, we have a long array of data, so basically a lot of features. We have high dimensionality in this space. We have several bands measured at several times and we increase the space there and we have more information from which we can make a decision of classifying a time series in one or the other class. Uh, but here I would uh, suggest an approach that we keep things as a more like a two-dimensional array, so where we actually have the, the different bands or the spectral signals, and we have the time actually organized in a time sequence. So, and that allows us to use some different type of approaches here. So it allows basically us to compare what happens in each step of time, basically. So this is what actually the dynamic time warping does. So instead of comparing the things with in the specific time when they were measured. So in this case, we can see here that things are happening in a different time. We actually uh, warp the measurements so that they can fit, so that we can better capture the timing of the events that are happening. So that's what basically dynamic time warping does. Yeah? I'm not gonna tell much more details about the method, but I'm gonna go uh, forward from here. Uh, but one issue with dynamic time warp is that it allows also for uh, like out of season alignments, basically meaning if you have a type of vegetation or land cover type or that is expected to happen in a certain period of time, it could also be uh, uh, aligned or matched to a sequence of time series that is not the correct one for that crop. Like if you have a winter crop and summer crop, so you could get this uh, issue. And then uh, to tackle this issue, basically uh, what uh, the solution we proposed here was to have a time waiting. So basically creating a, a soft a constraint that allows for the time warping, but not exaggerated warpings that match something that was expected in a summer season to a winter season, for example. So, and that was a quite a successful approach that we have uh, tested and, and published. Uh, and this um, basically um, are the kind of the advantages of this uh, method that we have been uh, observing and measuring. So we can uh, then handle uh, irregular, irregularly sampled time series, uh, time series with different lengths. Um, we don't need to do gap filling, which is also usually something that when you're constructing data cubes, you worry about having a regular sampled time series. So here we would handle these things. Uh, and, but one of the main features that I want to highlight more in this talk is the, the low uh, training data requirement for this approach. Uh, and that uh, is a, basically a feature of a combination of two methods, the dynamic time warping, which is a measure of distance that's non-linear. It's not a Euclidean distance measurement, but it's a non-linear 
distance measurement uh, combined with a nearest neighbor, one uh, first nearest neighbor uh, machine learning algorithm for classification. So that's the, the approach here. And uh, these are some uh, um, results from a toy, uh, some, some examples, some samples that I have for um, an area in Brazil. And I, just for comparison here, I did a one analysis, the one kind of cross validation, but it's a, you know that it's a bit different here. It's not uh, uh, you leave one out, but you leave all samples out, but one. So basically what I did here, just to check how the, perf how the method performs with, uh, if I had just one sample of per class, what would happen? So this is just an exercise for curiosity that I did here and compared with a random forest, for example, and uh, one thing that we can see here is that we have uh, uh, the, the kind of the, uh, doing a simulation of thousand times or we get uh, most of the time the dynamic time warping with a first near na nearest neighbor, you get a higher accuracy or the, the density of the accuracy here is more concentrated. So you have a more narrow uh, um, uh, distribution here. Uh, so another, uh, Point here, so if you have samples, if you have just one sample, you can already produce some information for the area. It might not be the best information, but you, you can produce some information even if you have very low density of training samples. And another approach to, to work with lack of samples here, which uh, this we have also produced uh, in 2016, this, this research, is that uh, it's actually not using samples anything, but this uh, time series you see here, these temporal patterns here, they were extracted from literature. So there was a study in a similar area that we were looking at. So we took this, uh, uh, this the patterns that were uh, available from the research paper and uh, produced maps for an area and did an accuracy assessment afterwards for these areas. And we reached here about 90% uh, of uh, overall accuracy and like users accuracy at least 87% for the, depending on the class here. So these are one alternative. So if you don't have any samples, you could still uh, get some information if you have papers or similar areas or similar crop types somewhere. And another approach that the method has been quite successful um, is on actually producing samples to other areas. This is a work from uh, Mariana Belgian. She's uh, in the Netherlands, I forgot the university now. So basically uh, what was done here is to have one area where you have some samples and you uh, basically use the method to create or to enlarge your training sets to different areas where you don't have information and then uh, apply another uh, machine learning method afterwards, which like random forest. In this case, I think she used random forest. So she enlarged, like creates more data to, so basically transfer the samples to another area. So this uh, worked quite well because like one characteristic of the dynamic time warping is that like um, it reduces a bit the variability of the class. So if there is a shift from one area to another, one, uh, one crop has is being planted a little bit later or a bit earlier than in the, in the area of, bit far away. So the method will take care of that. We'll still find the crop if there is this type of variability. That's why uh, it was quite successful in finding this, this new samples for the area. Uh, okay. Well, but then, yeah, this is an issue that uh, uh, for those that work with dynamic time warping, you know, so you have a high computational cost here. There are strategies to reduce this. I have some of these strategies implemented, but here I want to show one of these strategies, which is basically to, to reduce samples, which basically here is like all samples of different classes uh, for a certain area, to reduce these samples into temporal patterns. So you could use different methods for that, the average value, or you could use a more sophisticated uh, sophisticated smoothing algorithm. In this case, I use generalized add additive models to create these temporal patterns for the different class. And that way I reduce the number of samples I have to, comp to compare to, and therefore reduce the computational time. So as you know, like if you use a uh, nearest neighbor, you have to compare uh, your new, your, uh, the, the area of int or the pixel that you want to classify with all the samples in your, in your training set. But this way you can reduce substantially then the processing time just by creating patterns. 
And uh, this approach um, has been uh, quite successful out there. I have one example here that was just published now in 2000, uh, like last month by Peng. It's a group in the Beijing University, and they produced actually these temporal patterns for maize in China and have produced with the method uh, 20 years of maize for the whole country. So this was quite interesting work, and the accuracy also stays around uh, 87 or so. So it was quite a successful example. Well, and uh, coming to, to an end where you can actually find this, just to conclude my talk, uh, I have this, uh, this method implemented in an R package called uh, DTW set. I just released a new version of the package two weeks ago, uh, most, mostly because I had to replace some backends that some our packets were retiring now, and I now have a uh, backend with the uh, spatial temporal uh, arrays. This is a package from Edser. So if you are interested in uh, playing around, and we have a toy example there in the package, so you can install the package, and there is a vignette that will guide you through the steps to, to do the classification. And for the future versions, so I have been already discussing here with, with Joubert, but also with Marius uh, in Insta, Marius Apple, they probably know him, that's developed the GDAO Cubes library. So we are now discussing on how to improve here the backends to allow for large area classification. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. Questions? Thank you, Victor. Yes, Greg. Hi, thanks, Vito. Very nice. Um, I was wondering um, if um, I think maybe the first time I met you, we, we talked already about this. And I don't know if, I, if we talked about this. You'll let me know. Um, but at one point, I was also trying to do this, but with crops, including more physical information from the crops to know uh, growing degree days, no? Because you have agronomically, you could, you know that some plants will grow more depending on the temperature, which is basically dynamic time warping without the methodology. And I wonder what you, or thoughts, your thoughts on that, whether these kind of things could be implemented in your method, you know, something that actually imposes the warping uh, based on physical, things that we know that some plants, for example, wheat will, the minimum temperature is five degrees mm. and optimum would be. So I was wondering your thoughts on that, if that could be something to explore, because it, I think it could be really cool. Yeah, thanks. I, I remember the talk we had, uh, I don't know, 10 years ago, or <laughs> it's been a while, but uh, so I think that there could be the chance to change the, maybe the time waiting uh, parameters there to incorporate this. So here is a, it's a kind of elapsed time. So if you have a time difference between two observations, it receives some kind of weight there, but this could also be done with different parameters. So that I haven't tried, but maybe it's something to, would be happy to, to discuss and maybe. Okay, more questions? How computational is this method, dynamic time warping? Can you run it on like millions of pixels? Uh, sorry? Can you run it on millions of pixels? Well, uh, the Chinese guy did. I didn't do that yet. Well, I actually did that for Brazil during my PhD back then. Uh, it was Whole very- of Brazil. Huh? Whole of Brazil. No, no, only the Mato Grosso state. So it was uh, a couple of Modis and Modis resolution, Modis styles. Okay. Uh, but for the whole time, it was from 2000 to 2016, the data. It was pretty big. It took, uh, back then the method, uh, now there's some optimizations that I have been implementing and improving a little bit. But it, it was, uh, I think, a, a, a one or two days of processing. But I don't remember the machine now. That was a long time ago, uh, the, the size of the system. Okay. So, But now we are, yeah, I'm discussing with Schubert and with Marius the possibilities of the parallelization, because I don't have that in the R package, of course. Um, but there is like, uh, the implementation is already in, in Fortran and C++. I implemented the version C++ because many people were requesting it. But I tested the, the Fortran versions is still faster than the, the, the C++ implementation there. Maybe if someone is very good at the C++ could improve it. 
But besides that, there are some other strategies that can be implemented, which uh, is like the, this, the way you do the search and you could use a, a K3 to avoid checking all the samples. So there are different strategies that could be implemented there to avoid doing some computation. Okay, more questions? And this is dynamic time warping is not in SITS yet, no. It, in SITS, it's not in the SITS dynamic time warping. In SITS, uh, the SITS package, no, not yet, no. Okay. not yet, yeah. Okay. So hopefully soon coming. So. Okay, with this then we close. Thank you so much, Victor. Very Thank you. Interesting.